we're going to uh, start out with a uh, a short video uh, about the airplane just to introduce it it's uh, in our trip we found that a lot of people had never heard of or certainly seen one of these before so this uh, the factory's made a well, maybe four or five of these uh, videos from various places Hawaii Florida the southwest even like Bora Bora so this one is more uh, for pilots. Uh, it's uh, going to introduce the airplane and some of its capabilities. Last summer in July, Lyle and I celebrated um, 50 years together. And it wasn't long before I figured out that this guy I married, just by chance, was a man full of uh, what ifs and possibilities. And he um, was active Air Force when we married, and then he went to the Montana Guard and flew the F-106 for, for many years, and thus began the uh, stream of uh, street rods and assorted uh, vehicles coming in in bits and pieces laying around for not very long being built, sometimes sold for a foundation of a new home. And, uh, and then it evolved into the uh, fire truck that Lyle used to fight fires with back in Pembina, North Dakota, that had gotten shoved out the back door of the fire station because they got awarded a brand new shiny fire engine. And Lyle felt bad for the, the vehicle and we brought it out to Washington and did he do a number on it. He knew a very good street rotter by that time in Enumclaw, a well-known guy. And we used it to uh, take the, the uh, kids' baseball teams to Dairy Queen. And then he found a uh, wrecked Cessna 180 down in Oregon. We brought that home and it went to Montana and Lyle rebuilt it with a very good, talented friend of his uh, who was ex-Navy. And uh, then in 97, uh, we bought an RV6A. And that was about the time that we had a business that really took off in eastern Washington. So that was that long build airplane that I, I talked about. It, it, got, it got built over three years and sat in white paint in our hangar home in, uh, outside of Spokane for a long time. Now we really enjoy the heck out of that airplane, taking it down to visit our younger son in uh, Camus, quick trip instead of driving down I-5. Um, both our sons followed in Lyle's footsteps on our uh, captains at Alaska Airlines. And uh, uh, with that, I think I will turn it over to so there, Lyle. So there's a secret, you know, if you can have street rods and fire trucks and multiple airplanes in 50 years. <laughs> yeah, so you got to have somebody on your side if you're going to do all that. So Fun you're a good stuff. Salesman. I'm a good salesman. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Are you retired United? I flew for United for five years, and when the controllers all got fired back in the uh, early 80s, I was one of a thousand pilots that they laid off, and it was pretty interesting. Uh, both of our neighbors, we lived in Enumclaw, then down towards Tacoma. Both of uh, three of our neighbors on all three sides uh, of us uh, were Alaska pilots, and. And they went in and talked to the chief pilot and said, uh, Alaska's hiring, we know a guy who's current on the airplane, why don't you call him in for an interview? And his name was Captain Fox, he was the chief pilot, and he called me up, I was flying the Interceptor over in Montana, and said, uh, hey, we talked to the Welch brothers and Walletner, and they think we ought to hire you. And I said, who, who are you again? He said, oh, I'm the chief pilot of Alaska Airlines. And I said, I don't know, I would want to do that, Captain Fox. When this is over, I have a real airline to go back to. <laughs> but when I got hired to Alaska, we had six 727s. Now they have over 100 airplanes. And so uh, I uh, was in their instructing management field there for 30 years. It was a good move. My uh, friends who went to United all lost their retirement in a bankruptcy, and I didn't, so I can do this kind of stuff. So. And kind of an interesting point too, Lyle was in the first graduating class of the University of North Dakota's aviation program. Very first. So he knew John Odegaard in the, in the, in the beginning, uh, kind of a legend. Yeah, both of our sons graduated from there. Our daughter-in-law is a co-pilot at Alaska and she graduated from there. But you guys came to hear about the AirCam, not us. So, um, 
So I uh, want to talk about um, the airplane itself and, and compare it a little bit. Uh, there's several RV guys in here and, and people who built metal airplanes. So uh, we've done both. Um, the kits are not similar, but there are uh, there are things uh, like you was listening. You talk about the lag time waiting to get an airplane back from the Philippines for the guys building Vans airplanes. Uh, we did a quick build at Vans, and they shipped the kit over on a on a boat. Um, they built the wings in a jig, uh, partially built them. They did the fuselage bottom half in a jig, so it came back. Uh, it wasn't as pre-punched as the new ones are, but it, it was true and square and plumb, and it was easy to start from that and go. Um, but comparing building the air cam to the uh, RV, the air cam is a much more complex airplane. Uh, it was a quick build as well. The, the quick build uh, is done right at the factory, and it consists of just two parts, uh, but it saves about 500 hours on the build time. It's built in a jig so it comes out square. This is the belly upside down that I'm working on here and the part leaning on the left there that's in primer is the center wing section which is also standard aluminum framing build like an, just like if you were building an RV. Uh, the same kind of idea. Um, and then that's the extent of the metal parts on the wing. Uh, big difference uh, between the two, this one's completely pop riveted and it doesn't matter that you have all those heads of the pop rivets because it's going to fly, well its maximum speed's 100 and so it usually flies about the traffic patterns at 65, it lands, it stalls at 34, so, so are you worried about parasite drag? You know, you just aren't. It's not built to go fast. So pop rivets, way easier. The van stuff, we had to countersink all of those. And and Laurel was a big help in the van's airplane because she has long, skinny arms and can reach all the way into the ends of the lightning holes and buck rivets. And there are no buck rivets at all on this. So in that respect, the metal part's uh, somewhat easier. But, but this airplane uh, has standard aluminum construction. It's got the old school um, shrink to fit fabric construction like a Piper Cub. And then it's got uh, the wing sections, the outer wing sections are more like an ultralight. And so they use some composite Dacron stuff. Uh, they call it an envelope. Uh, it's not at all like, uh, like standard construction. So there are a lot of different parts to this airplane. Um, you can see uh, the airplane came out of the jig looking sort of like this, uh, but one of the things that I found unique about working on this airplane is, is uh, you put it together uh, with the manual, and, and, and I was doing this as a builder assist thing. The guy who helped me actually design the very first air cam, um, he was Phil Lockwood, the guy in the movie, he was his boss. Uh, Phil Lockwood was his salesperson. Uh, so he, he worked there 25 years and retired, and now he builds either four or six air cams a year with somebody like me. Uh, he builds them in two, kind of like Boeing. They come down the assembly line in pairs. Um, so it takes, if it takes like, say, four hours to do one part on the first airframe coming down, it takes about two hours or maybe an hour and a half to do the second one because... They're exactly the same, and, and the learning process of how the parts go together, even though this guy has been doing it for several years now, I figured out, this isn't true for all of the parts, but the parts can go on left to right, right to left, up to down, and down to up. You can put every, all those brackets and things fit four different ways, and, they, and, and it matters which of those ways they go on. And so... I would be clicking stuff together and Dennis would come over and look at it and go, that one's upside down. <laughs> Just looking at him, he knew. So he was a great help. Uh, not only was he the technician and the experience, but he, when he retired, he built a building, um, I don't know how many square feet it was, but it was big enough for like maybe three of these airplanes to fit in and it had his apartment. And then he built a separate apartment with just a bedroom, bathroom, shower kind of thing. And when I was there, I, that's where I lived. 
Um, so I would stay for two or three weeks at a time when I'd go down there and then come back. And he and his assistant would keep working on it while I was gone. But, but besides the parts commonality thing uh, and the confusion of that, after you drill all of these and have it clicked together, then you have to take it all apart. And then, is it when you dimple your stuff? Do you have to take them apart again? Uh, because every time you drill something, you have to deburr them, right? Yeah, so you have to take them apart, and then you have to put them back together again, and then click them, and then rivet them, and then paint them. And so, so it's not a very short process to do all that stuff. Mentioned that it's got all the parts. So all the flying surfaces, the ailerons, flaps, rudder, all that sort of stuff, uh, are standard fabric like a, like building a cub. Uh, and it, you know, it's if you guys have worked with that stuff at all, it's really stinky. You got to have an exhaust fan, uh, and the whole house smells like that when you're doing that MEK stuff. And 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 so I learned how to do that. And and I keep pushing the wrong button. And this is just an example of the other metal part of the airplane. That's the center wing section. There'll be more pictures of that as we go along. But that, uh, that's where all of the engines and the fuel tanks and stuff go. It is shrink to fit stuff. Uh, there's, I know there's lots of options on how you do fabric, but after you get them done, then you have to... He had three different irons that he hung on the wall, and they're all set to different temperatures, so you you knew what temperature you were working with depending on which job you were doing. Um, the vertical stabilizer is metal too. Uh, that plumb uh, bob weight thing is for the elevator. Uh, so the structural parts were metal, but the other parts weren't. That's the fuel tanks up there. <coughs> There'll be some pictures of the engine here. This is an unusual thing for an airplane. Um, because they have Rotax 912 ULS engines on board. And so um, they are 100 horsepower. They uh, automatically set the mixture. They don't like to run on uh, 100 low lead gas. They don't care for the lead. If you, It's 50 hours between oil changes if you're using car gas. It's 25 hours if you're using uh, 100 low lead, and you have to put uh, additives in it to uh, make the the actual chemical composition of the lead changes, and it burns it. It turns into a, like a white ash that's on the exhaust pipe. What additive did you, did you use? Declan. Good, yes, I've got that. Yeah. Declan and the hanger. Yeah. Um, but here's the biggest difference in the engines. They're not just air cooled; they're water cooled as well, and so. So the radiators fit on top of the wing, at the, they're part of the engine mount system. Uh, and there's actually an air scoop on the bottom of the wing, like an S-tube thing that takes the water, or water the air on the underside of the wing, <coughs> vents it up through the uh, radiators, and then exhausts it over the top of the engines. Very efficient. It works good on the ground even when you're not moving. The engine mounts are... I was wishing we could have brought the airplane here this morning, and we got up early and pre-flighted it, and then the weather went to pot. It lives over in Anacortes, and it was four or 500 overcast when we left. So you would be impressed with the engine mounts. It's a single tube, and you think, how on earth is that going to hold the engine in place? Um, but it does. They've been around for 25 years now. The 51% rule applies to these airplanes, just like the stuff you guys are building. So you don't have to build 51% of it, but you have to do 51% of the tasks. And so I only built one of the landing gear, and his, he and his assistant built the other one. But, but you get the whole deal, you know, with the brakes and all that stuff. So, so it was a complete build for me to go through that. Um, the wing just comes in pieces. It's not built in a jig. It just comes in pieces like that. Um, it's uh, pop riveted together. And... Um, and then there's this Dacron uh, envelope that goes on uh, on top of it. And, you know, um, you're used to that sort of thing going on and then being shrunk. And these are not like that. They are sewn uh, at a place in Utah, uh, made out of sailcloth, if that makes sense to you. Um, and it's not shrink to fit. They are really tight to put on. And so they have a mechanism at the far end. You see that piece of wood at the far end? It's uh, set up on a 
like uh, an all thread thing that you you pull it as tight as you can get and then you back it all the way off and reattach it and then you pull it again and it's done with velcro if you can imagine the velcro holds it with all of that stress and you stretch it onto the wing and then it's on and it still looks doesn't look anything like a wing it's not shaped like a wing but if you can see the uh, the sideways pockets that are sewn into it that's where the ribs go the ribs go in afterwards and they're just tubular and square uh, tube mm -hmm. stuff that goes in and forms the airfoil there's over the top and and underneath the flat ones of course are on the bottom so a completely different kind of uh, construction for the wing for me um, he has a, Dennis has a homemade paint booth that's just made with uh, like blue tarps, you know, it's got a fan at one end and a filter at the other end and the EPA doesn't know it's there. <laughs> and uh, so I did priming and stuff, but when it came to uh, painting the airplane, um, there was a sign painter guy, uh, he was actually an artist. He, uh, in Florida, they have, a, they have what they call outdoor rooms for the bugs and all they are is it's people's garages but they have these curtains that come down that are like a really fine mesh that keeps the mosquitoes and the noceums out and this guy makes his living painting scenes with airbrushes um, on these outdoor rooms in Florida and he did a remarkable job painting my airplane that's his finished work not mine but I got credit for painting because I did the priming stuff um, a difference to being, uh, you know, regular airplanes, like one of you guys has a Cherokee, uh, the Cessnas and stuff with the ELTs that you're so used to. These new airplanes, uh, that's the ELT there. Uh, they're up in the wing root, and they don't transmit on 121.5. They send their signal to a satellite, mm -hmm. and the satellite sends it to the Coast Guard, and the Coast Guard calls the nearest ground station, in our case, uh, on our very first flight, um, a design flaw in the airplane is that uh, when you plug your headset in to the jacks on the airplane, you turn on the ELT. Perfect. <laughs> and so, so we were sitting at the end of the runway and this yellow truck comes out and says, do you guys crash? <laughs> we just got a call from the Coast Guard. So now it's got duct tape over it so you can't Turn it's, it on, it's put right here. Here's the plugs. Yeah, they, they, they're this far here. apart. Yeah. So, anyway, they they talk to the satellites now. So it's I used to fly airliners, and we we're always getting calls. Could you turn in 121.5 and listen for an ELT and tell us when you can't hear it anymore? And then they would get a they would get 30 airplanes do that, and they could kind of tell about where to go look. So, anyway, that's new to me. Um, a lot of structure is involved in uh, this part of the airplane. Obviously, all the lift and the engines and all that stuff are all up on top of the wing, and the canoe part just hangs underneath it. And so there's some serious engineering in that part of the airplane to put all that weight hanging from the top section. Um, they've got the horizontals and the diagonals, and it's pretty, it's pretty beefed up. There's the engine going on top of the wing. Um, people have asked, how do you do your annual condition report uh, on an airplane like this? And so anything that has to be looked at has either a fairing or a cover of some kind on it. And so I was just putting riv nuts in there so that you can put them on, take them off. It's got uh, metal fairings like uh, the Vans airplane. It's got uh, zippers in the wings like an ultralight. And it's got uh, metal covers that are Velcroed on at the wing root so you can take them off and check all the connections. Um, so it's actually pretty easy to open up to do the annual condition report. But it kind of is, again, a combination of three different kinds of, of flying. I think the hardest part of building it was um, wiring. I'm not an electrician. Uh, fortunately, one of the guys, there were only two guys who worked there, the other younger guy, uh, used to work in a radio shop in Tennessee somewhere, so he was, I mean, like a manufacturer. The nose piece, I've got in my arms there, it's fiberglass, it's one piece, and uh, it's pretty light, but it makes it streamlined. That's the wing getting ready to go on. 
A short side note on the wing, there were two airplanes being built together. The other guy uh, is from Bend, Oregon. Um, and they had labels on the uh, wings as to whose was which wing. When we, uh, when we put the uh, right wing on, it fit real nice. When we carried the left wing on to put it on, it was a right wing. <laughs> so we, they, the painter had painted two wings, and they were both right wings. And so he had to quickly go paint. It took three days to paint the other wing, to prime it and paint it and paint it and paint it. And then we, so that was a unexpected delay. I hope they learned the something from that with a little bit of blue tape. Marvelous. <laughs> it's got, uh, somebody was talking about warp drive props. It's got uh, warp drive uh, fixed pitch props. They're composite. They're very stiff and sharp. They're, this airplane you have to, uh, almost like the old DC-6s, uh, before you start them you have to count like 20 blades to burp the, burp the engine, yeah, to get the oil up into the engine. Twice. Hard, yeah, hard on the fingers. Yeah, you got to do it for each engine. <clears throat> But they were good props. That's what it looked like when it rolled out of the hangar. It was all in one piece. Um, what were we going to talk about the tail number? Oh, yeah. Well, the 106, Lyle flew the 106, and our initials this time, uh, we did something a little different for the, the 6A. But, but the uh, painter dude guy, uh, he wanted to do something unique to the airplane, so he... Uh, on the very tail piece uh, of the enclosure, uh, he took it off and put a uh, picture of the F-106 shooting a, a Genie rocket off of it uh, that uh, that I had done years before. And world record at the yeah, time. It was, it was a world record. Yeah, that's down, right. And that's okay. how that's how we named her Genie. The airplane's well, name is Genie, and it's got a picture of the Genie rocket on the <laughs> on the back of it. And then we after after that we rolled it back into the airport uh, or the hangar and weighed it. And so here's your one test question of the day. Um, it weighs 1,185 pounds. What's the weight? Maximum if you're going to be a light support aircraft. 1320. 1320, except if it's an amphib. Uh, but this one isn't. This is a ground airplane. We aren't putting ours on floats. We yeah, won't fly. So it weighs uh, it weighs less than 1320. So is it an is it a light support aircraft? That's the gross weight, 1320. Yeah, and a light support can only have one engine. That's another point. So it's not. So you have to have a regular pilot license and medical and all that for and that. Multi. And a multi-engine mm -hmm. license, yep. Yeah, which I'll have to get. If so I here was something. I'd never way. built a tailwheel airplane before. Um, we had to jack up the tail and put it on, uh, on a stand to weigh it because it has to be weighed in its level flight condition in order to get the three weights for the three wheels. 